Before, thanks Hemant for all the kind words and uh, good introduction to the hospital. As Hemant has said, it's a hospital for the doctors, by the doctors, and we are sticking to our principles and ethicality all the time. Uh, I'll take this occasion to give a brief me memento to Dr. Hemant. Uh, Right. So, ECMO has been my passion right from day one. Uh, while I was in UK, when I finished my FRCS, my bosses asked me, Praveen, do you want to go ahead with pediatric cardiac surgery? My boss, Jim Pollock and Kevin Kenny MacArthur. Then I said, uh, pediatric cardiac surgery, I have not made any plans to stay in the country forever because I'm planning to relocate back to India. And as I'm not sure how many doctors or cardiac surgeons are out here or perfusionists, pediatric cardiac surgery, Dr. Prabhakar you must be knowing, it's not a viable project in India because it takes so much of toll on the parents, on the hospital, on the government as well. Say, supposedly we operate a child in RQ3, some complex cardiac, uh, I mean, pediatric patients will need multiple procedures by the time they attain teenage or by the time they attain adolescence. It takes lots of money, lots of strain, and emotional dis, uh, distraught. Doesn't help in the family's growing. For me, any cardiac surgery means should have a meaningful outcome. The lifestyle of the individual should be far better than before. Then only any surgeon or a surgery is successful. If we do a operate a child, let them as a vegetation, as, as a vegetable, or of no use to society, it's of no help. I mean, end of the day, any surgery should help the individual in improving the quality of life and should be useful for the society. So then I told my bosses, probably pediatric surgery, I'm not that happy. Then they suggested, okay, go ahead with transplant program, which is going to go ahead in a big way in the next few years. I said, fine. And then I moved on to join as the first transplant fellow in Scotland. So until then, only England and rest of uh, places had uh, fellowships in transplant program. I moved on. And it was good that I had uh, initiated the transplant program in Scotland, and then we more, I was the first fellow in transplant program and mechanical circulatory support systems in NWTC, that is National Waiting Times Board. And after that, I never looked back because I moved on, and uh, we did about close to 25 transplants and uh, 18 uh, LWADs in a period of two years. And the ECMO is sort of a bridge to transplant, bridge to recovery, bridge to do most of the times. So ECMO was like day in, day out. I was on 24-7 on call all the time being in the hospital. So that's my passion. And then I've seen the results with ECMO. I've seen the results with LVAR, seen the results with transplants. So when I spoke to him and when I was relocating, I said, this is going to be my metal and this is what we have to take this forward. Yes, we are struggling in terms of getting the patients because the funds are quite uh, on the low scarcity. But still, we are moving ahead and we are doing. At times, we are trying to support from the NGOs, organizations, from the hospital, from the patients, from CM Relief Fund to bail out patients on ECMO or LVADs or for transplant. So moving on, ECMO. Uh, this is quite a new thing. I mean, it's a new, but why is a new device on the block? Uh, we talk of ventilators. We talk of uh, dialysis machines. We talk of so many things. But ECMO is quite a new thing in the medical fraternity, especially for the even junior doctors. When we speak to people around and say, we got ECMO, they think it is ECHO. Then I said, no, it's not ECHO, it's ECMO. When we say ECMO, it's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So it's, I keep telling people, it, this is a device one step ahead of the mechanical ventilator. Ventilator only supports your lungs. This is a device which supports your lungs and the heart if they are failed. So this is an extracorporeal, outside the body, membrane oxygenation gives oxygenation to the body. As we all know, hypoxia doesn't help any organ in the body. Any amount of hypoxia can shut down other organs, brain, heart, lungs, I mean, uh, kidneys, liver, everything can take a hit, and then hypoxic injury is pretty hard to reverse. So our main aim for in any intensive care is to have proper oxygenation saturations so that the outcomes are far better. So the ECMO has come into four, 
where there have been failure of the heart, failure of the lungs, or multi-organ, I mean, sepsis, general sepsis. So today, I mean, uh, actually we were wanting to take uh, Dr. Suresh Rao, who is coming from Chennai. Uh, he is one of the authorities on VA ECMO, and he works along with Dr. Bala, Balakrishnan in uh, Fortis Malar and has a vast experience with VA ECMO and transplants. So he would be giving his uh, talk on VA ECMO. But before that, since he, it is taking a bit of a while for him to come along from the airport, I'll move on with VV ECMO. When I say VV ECMO, it's a veno venous extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. How many of them, how, how few are doctors here? Perfusionists? All right. Intensivists? Few of them, right, good. Uh, and we have Dr. Ashok as a pulmonologist, uh, probably. Uh, so when I am talking, I'm, today we are not trying to emphasize much on the nitty gritty of the ECMO. We are trying to go into the basics of ECMO so that all the individuals will understand that there is something called an ECMO device, which is a salvage device which can be utilized in an emergency, in a crash situation. Uh, because at this point of time in Europe, it's no more CPR, it is eCPR. All casualties and ER rooms are bound to be equipped with an ECMO machine for an emergency eCPR, that is ECMO CPR, where your CPR sometimes can be futile. You have downtimes, but uh, in spite of the restoration of the circulation, the oxygenation will be affected. So if you ha can put a patient on an ECMO by percutaneous cannulation, which is an eCPR, the outcomes are far better, especially in hospital eCPR are far better outcomes. So I'm going to talk about indications, cannulation, and management. So what is ECMO? It's a form of extracorporeal life support where venous blood is drained from the patient with an artificial circuit and is oxygenated through an oxygenator. Carbon dioxide is removed and returned back to the patient. It's very simple to understand. Just need to understand the basics. Blood is drained, oxygenated, carbon dioxide taken out, put back to the patient. So the oxygenated blood is going back to the patient. So the job of the lungs is being done by this machine outside the body. That is the reason we are calling it as extracorporeal. And membrane oxygenation, the job of lungs is done by an artificial oxygenator, which is a silicon oxygen membrane, which does the, trans, uh, the, the exchange of gases across the membrane. And in ECMO, the blood flow is to be optimized. The, any average 70 kg adult individual, the cardiac output is about 5 liters or close to about 5 liters. So that what does ECMO do? The ECMO drains out close to 5 liters and delivers about 5 liters of blood back to the patient. So the cardiac output is also being maintained by the ECMO machine. And in VB ECMO, the native heart is functioning, is intact, cardiac function is overall much better. But in somebody with a cardiomyopathy or a cardiac failure, the heart is not working. So we tend to support the heart as well there. So it's a VA ECMO. And when we say VA ECMO, it's more like a long-term cardiopulmonary bypass, which most of the cardiac surgeons are used to. So uh, there is a basic difference between the cardiopulmonary bypass machine used in the theaters and the ECMO machine. The difference is being, first and foremost, it's a short term in the cardiac in the cardiac theaters. The oxygenator lasts for about eight to ten hours. Sometimes maybe a bit longer, but the maximum time is eight to ten hours and there is a reservoir in the cardiopulmonary bypass machine in the theaters where the patient's blood is drained off. We are operating on a patient who has a bloodless field in the cardiac, uh, in the pericardium. Whereas in ECMO, it's a long-term oxygenator. It's a silicone membrane. The oxygenator has been manufactured to last for 28 days, which is company certified for 28 days. And our longest running ECMO oxygenator was for 58 days. And if it's a closely monitored oxygenation, heparin, anticoagulation, probably we can run an oxygenator close to uh, 58 days. Uh, and the other thing, as I've told, there is no reservoir. The patient himself is the reservoir in an ECMO machine, in an ECMO circuit. So how do we mention, I mean, how do you name the ECMO? When I say VV ECMO, you just say VV, okay. Then I, Dr. Suresh Rao is here. Welcome, Dr. Suresh Rao. Uh, uh, so when we say VV, it's a veno-venous ECMO. Essentially, we are trying to bypass the lungs and support the lungs. So it's a veno-venous ECMO. The native cardiac function is intact. When we talk of VA ECMO, it's a veno-arterial. So 
just need to think into the cardiac circulation. The blood is drained from the systemic venous side into the right side of the heart, right atrium, right ventricle, right ventricle to pulmonary artery to lungs. And from there, oxygenated, comes back into the left atrium, left ventricle, iota, systemic circulation. So in the VA ECMO, the systemic side of the venous side is the blood is drained from the patient. It is oxygenated, it is pumped through a centrifugal pump, through an oxygenator, oxygenated back to the patient through the arterial circulation, which can be again, uh, the again canalization will talk by Dr. Suresh Raghuru, but the blood is, arterial blood is back to the patient. So essentially the heart and lungs job is being done by the ECMO circuit. So that's a VA ECMO. So when we say VV, as I've said, we know venous refers to cannula insertion site, type, tip, position, and size. And then you have got access cannulas and return cannulas. When I say access cannulas, blood is being coming out of the patient. That is access cannula. Blood is being drained out. Return cannula is something where the blood is going back to the patient. And then we talk of distal perfusion cannula, which will be dealt by Dr. Suresh again, which is part of the VA ECMO. Then coming to indications for we know venous ECMO. So just need to think, wherever the lungs are not functioning, wherever the hypoxia is happening, there is a, apart from mechanical ventilation, if there is a residual lung where the mechanical ventilation can provide support, if your mechanical ventilation is not helping much in terms of oxygen saturation or the carbon dioxide out, wash out, what we call normal ventilation. There are two mechanisms for, oxygen, for uh, lungs. One is oxygenation, two is carbon dioxide washout. Let us be very clear. When we say ventilation, it is carbon dioxide washout. So basically, whenever you have an issue with low oxygenation, high carbon dioxide uh, sitting up, hiking, which is not amenable or not compatible with life. So you need to have a system wherein the oxygenation and the ventilation are also happening at the same time. So what are the conditions where in pediatrics or in neonatal where you have the lungs have given away and there is no proper oxygenation, no proper ventilation? In the respiratory, meconium aspiration syndrome, most of the newborns, they can be put on VV ECMO at birth. And once the meconium is taken out, bronchoscopies, mechanical ventilator, uh, regular bronchial toileting, the lungs get recruited and you can slowly start weaning and the child can come off the VV ECMO. Then you have perspiratory pulmonary hypotension of children, which again, they can be put on a VV ECMO. You can use all your conservative measures of uh, vasodilators, pulmonary vasodilators so that your pulmonary hypertension starts coming down, lungs are recruited, and again, you can take off them of the VV ECMO. Then CDH, congenital diaphragmatinous. I mean, we tend to see lots of uh, inquiries coming for us for CDH. How can we deal with this child, hypoxia, and, uh, hypercapnia? How to go about? Then we tell, suggest them, put them on VV ECMO, operate the congenital diaphragmatic hernia, the lung is fixed, and once the lungs uh, start taking over, they can come off the ECMO, they can go on to normal mechanical ventilation. Then severe pneumonia, bilar both lungs, totally gubbed, white out, no oxygenation, no ventilation. The answer is VV ECMO. Need to be done at the right time. You can't wait till the multi-organ failure sets in. Adults, again, severe pneumonia, ARDS, thoracic trauma, lung contusion. We tend to see lots of flail chest uh, where the patients are inability to maintain saturations on mechanical ventilation. Then we tend to put them on VV ECMO which is really helpful, and patients have been put on VV ECMO following a thoracic trauma for good, say, one month, close to one month, and they have recovered. Then smoke inhalation injury as well. Then ECMO as a resuscitative measure. I was talking to you about eCPR. This is where it comes as cardiac arrest, cardiogenic shocks, cardiac trauma, drug overdoses, hypothermia, pulmonary edema, pulmonary embolism. We did one massive pulmonary thrombolectomy about four months back. Uh, it was a total saddle embolus involving the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, right into the branch pulmonary arteries. And when he was brought into the ER, he was almost arrested. We took him to the theater on CPR, put him onto bypass machine, and then we have uh, did the thromboembolectomy. Post procedure, the RV was a bit struggling. I did think of putting an uh, ECMO onto him, but luckily with the inotropes itself, the RV started uh, resolving, and we didn't have to put on him ECMO. But ECMO can be done in pulmonary thromboembolectomy patients as well as a standby post embolectomy when the RV is struggling because the RV strain is one thing which is not going to allow the patient to progress for a better outcome. Then what are the contraindications? Presence of additional chronic organ failures like cirrhosis, 
COPD, end-stage renal failure, end-stage liver failures. They are not the candidates for ECMO. As I've always said, there should be a meaningful outcome for whatever the procedure we are offering. If the outcome or if the quality of life is not going to alter, please take a step back and think, am I going to do anything good to this patient? If you are not able to bring the outcome as a better outcome, probably just put your step back and say, no, this is not possible. It's contraindicated. There have been umpteen times where I get calls from people saying, can we do an ECMO on this uh, gentleman who has got a multi-organ failure, sepsis? I said, look, kidneys have failed, liver has failed, brain we are not sure. Am I going to do something good to this patient? And ECMO is not a device. It's a angel and a devil as well. It can do both. So we've got to be very careful when we are dealing with ECMO unless until the technical personnel or your staff are trained enough or understand what are the outcomes, what can go wrong. It's going to be very difficult. And then again, severe brain injury. We don't know the outcome. If the CNS is gapped, what about the meaningful outcome? No. So then probably we need to think, is this patient is going to make a meaningful life post ECMO? If yes, yes, go ahead. If not, probably again, take a step back. Don't go ahead with your ECMO because the patient is on uh, anticoagulants. He can bleed. If this is a brain injury, he might bleed inside and we can do nothing. Then age more than 75 years. Yes, sometimes people are there who are good 75, so you need to take a clinical call based upon the said individual, what, what I mean, how good he is in terms of comorbidities, other things have to be taken into consideration. So what are the candles we use in ECMO? I'm basically concentrating on VV ECMO. So blood flow in ECMO circuit is dependent on size of the cannula. So as we, I mean, most of the cardiac surgeons do understand to assist a cardiopulmonary bypass, we tend to use uh, arterial venous cannulas so that the flows are maintained for the at least two-thirds of the regular cardiac output for a proper perfusion of the end organs. And as we are all aware, the, di the flow is proportional to the fourth power of the internal diameter. This is again Pauzelis law uh, and inversely proportional to the length. Hence, shorter cannula with a greater internal dia will provide higher flows. So, we know venous ECMO to support patients with respiratory dysfunction can be single lumen or double lumen cannula. We have got some cannulas here in the machine as well. So post lecture in the afternoon, post lunch session, I will show you what all the cannulas are available. How do we do that? We have the uh, ECMO circuit itself and the ECMO machine, the console with the hemotherm as well. So that will show you, can give you a bit of a demonstration huh? so that what is involved in an ECMO, in a VV ECMO and also in a veno arterial ECMO. As I've said, this is only to make you understand today what is ECMO, what is involved, how can it be done, and then probably the uh, management can be done in a later CME. Then we have a single lumen or a double lumen cannulas, a right or left interjugular vein can be used, or right femoral vein for single lumen cannulas, right internal jugular vein for double lumen cannula, which is called Avalon cannulas, and then all patients on ECMO have to be hypernized. So usually I tend to maintain an ACT of about when I say ACT, it's activated clotting time, which is the anticoagulation profile which we look into at the time of patients on being on cardiopulmonary bypass or when they're kept on ECMO. So heparin of 50 to 100 units per kg to maintain an ACT of 160 to 180. So as I've said, you've got to be very careful and very stringent in your ACTs when you're running the ACTs. An ACT of 200, patient bleeds somewhere in the brain, chest, abdomen, can sometimes bleed into the compartments, like uh, uh, closed compartment syndromes as a bleeding in because of injury into the muscle. Yes, abdomen probably can do a laparotomy, chest you can put a chest strain, brain, the game is over. Just, you got to get your DC ready. So, got to be very careful when you're running your ACTs, maintain a strict ACT of 160 to 180 seconds, that's where it's run. Sometimes, we I also look into the INR of the patients, where the liver function is reflected. An INR of 1.5, stop heparin. Stop heparin. The ACT circuit will run on INR of 1.5, somewhere close to 2, because there are patients who have liver failures. That is, then that is where I call them auto-anticoagulated. So the liver is doing the job. Heparin should be out of the picture. See to it that the heparin syringe is out of the uh, ICU room so that nobody puts the heparin into the patient. And you can always have a look into your membrane and your circuit. Are there any signs of any clots? That itself will give you an indication. So it's a very close watch by your perfectionist, your nursing team, the anesthetist, and the surgeon as well. 
So patient selection. As I've told you again, time and again, I'm telling you for life-threatening form of respiratory and or cardiac failure, where the risks of less invasive support are considered more harmful than ECMO. I hope everybody got it. Where the mechanical ventilation or other measures are not doing enough and they are proving to be more harmful. You have got more inotropes, more mechanical ventilation, high PEEP, high pressures, risk of barotrauma, solidified lungs, more inotropes, high adrenaline, high neobutamine, lactic acidosis going up, patient become acidotic. Don't wait until they turn acidotic. Don't wait till the lungs are totally fibrotic. This is the time when you have to go in. I'll tell you what are the clear indicators where ECMO has to be initiated very quickly. And there is a reasonable expectation of long-term survival without disability. When I say disability, patients can have a stroke, patients can lose a limb, patients can have a ischemic gut, patients sometimes can lose a lung. So you need to think, can I treat this patient as a whole? Can I bring this patient completely as one piece without losing any organ? Yes, there are times when you need to think, yes, am I going to lose this organ? Am I going to lose something else? At that point, you need to think, is the life more important? I mean, I'll show you another example very quickly where we did one case here. We had to break our heads. How to go about with this case? So these are the cannulas which we normally use for ECMO. When you say red, they are written cannula. That is, oxygenated blood is coming to the patient. Blue, venous drainage. So they are called access cannulas. So they are single cannulas. So this is the femoral cannulas. These are the arterial cannulas which go into either the carotids or into the femoral artery or into the IJV. So this can be into the femoral through the right femoral which can drain from the right atrium. So your entire systemic circulation is drained from the patient. Goes to the max circuit, ECMO circuit, gets oxygenated back to the patient through, through this cannula. So this is the circuit. If you can see here. So this is the single lumen cannulas which have been used here. So this is the cannula into the patient's right femoral vein. Blood is being drained. If you can see the color of the blood here is a bit dark. So this is the centrifugal pump. So the centrifugal pump, what it does, it sucks out blood from the patient and then sends blood out. It's the pressure. And with the pressure, it goes across this membrane oxygenator, which has got oxygen ports connected to the oxygenator from the outside. So the blood gets, it's an interface where the blood and oxygen gets interfaced and the carbon dioxide is eliminated. And there is, a, within the machine, there is a, something called a sweep circuit where you can take out the carbon dioxide. Oxygenated blood going back to the patient. So essentially in here, the heart is still functioning. Only the venous side of the blood is being taken out because the lungs are faulty, not oxygenating. Uh, it's being oxygenated and put back to the patient for proper oxygenation of the rest of the organs. So these are the normal cannulas used for VV ECMO, which are called double lumen cannulas. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, these cannulas have been manufactured and uh, whoever has uh, invented them has been very intelligent enough to understand the vagaries of a cardiac surgeon. So it's, it makes life very easy for a cardiac surgeon. Uh, I mean, especially you just think as somebody who is 80 kgs, 90 kgs, obese female patient, 45, or obese male individual, setting up an ephemeral cannula, I need at least three people to retract the entire blubber to put a femoral cannula right into the groin. But these cannulas, you just need to put them into the neck and they have got both the access and the return cannula ports incorporated into those cannulas. So they come with three different sizes, pediatric, teenagers and bit older individuals. They are called Avalon or Oregon cannulas which are available now in India. But the only thing is the price, yes, it's about 1.4 lakhs for each cannula. But if so, you want somebody to have a safe outcome, you need to think of a quick procedure and a safe outcome. So this is the cannula which has been designed. If you can see the, the red thing, the blue thing takes out blood. It has got two ports, three ports in sense. One is the distal and one side ports. So they suck out blood from the uh, SVC right atrial junction and the IVC junction, where the right atrium is connected to the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. That is where the venous blood comes into the right atrium. So the blood is sucked out from the mouth of the SVC, mouth of the IVC. So that is where the entire systemic venous blood is being drawn. 
And the oxygenator is the same circuit again. So once the blood is drawn, it goes into the centrifugal pump, oxygenator comes back to the patient to the return port, where the oxygenated blood is from this side port, goes into the patient to the right atrium. So the these cannulas are inserted under the guidance of 2D echo, uh, 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 transphysical echo or in the cath lab, where we can see that the tip of the cannula should be at the mouth of the IVC, and the other uh, uh, drainage cannula has to be at the mouth of the SVC. They can be done blindly as well, if you have a bedside echo, and they can be done blindly as well. So this is how it looks, the cannula, double lumen cannula, going into the right internal jugular vein, the tip is lying somewhere here, just around the mouth of the IVC, and then here, where the blood is coming here. So if this is a bit of a closer loop, and the returns blood is directed towards the tricuspid valve, because when, when you go back into the single lumen cannulas, you can understand here, see both the cannulas are coming into the right atrium here, the drainage cannula and the returns cannula. The oxygenated blood once comes into the right atrium, there is every possibility that this venous cannula will suck out oxygenated blood. So the patient will not get enough blood. So this circuit or this pipeline will become red. So there is no, not enough oxygenated blood going back to the patient. So that is called phenomenon of recirculation. So the recirculation has to be prevented or lessened as much as possible. So the lie of the cannula, the position of the tip of the cannula in the single stage cannulas has to be very, I mean, uh, careful that it should not cross or hit on each other. So when the oxygenated blood is coming back, if they are seeing each face to face, the oxygenated blood goes back into your uh, suction cannula because this is a, essentially a, with a negative pressure. The uh, centrifugal pump is trying to draw blood. So it sucks out all the oxygenated blood. So we shouldn't do that. So the cannula should be either crossed over, which can be done, or the venous drainage cannula should be quite way low. So whatever the oxygenated blood is coming should go into the patient, not back into your circuit. That can be avoided in this dual lumen cannula, which is called an Avalon or a Rigon. So the phenomenon of recirculation is far less in a double lumen cannula. So if you can see, two ports here, one and one here. This is the return port. Blood is directed towards the tricuspid valve. So essentially the phenomenon of recirculation is prevented. So what are the clinical triggers for ECMO, VV ECMO? Inability to maintain a saturations of 88 or a pH of more than 7.2 with mechanical ventilation settings with a plateau pressures of less than 35, tidal volume of less than 6 ml per kg. Despite diuretic therapy, your trial of high PEEP, high frequency oxygenation, inhaled nitric oxide, inotropes, and then there is a progressive lung injury, and then you are want, uh, getting to see multi-organ failure. Don't wait until it's uh, multi-organ failure sets in. Then you will end up having a CVVH on the ECMO circuit. So as many, po I mean, trying to help the other organs on an ECMO will be very difficult. Single organ failure, bailing out them will be much more easier, comfortable. So what are the other uh, specific things you do uh, as part of ECMO, like uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, chest x-ray to look at the progress of the lung, CBP to look at your hemoglobin, your white cell count, what sort of antibiotics, how many bloods, how many platelets need to be given, renal parameters, kidneys have to be looked on a regular basis, if creatinine is going up or if it's becoming more acidotic, need to think of a CVVH, which can be done onto the ECMO circuit, need not put a separate uh, permacath, for CVVH, you can straight away put it onto the ECMO circuit uh, in the post pump, this thing. And then your hemoglobin has to be maintained at a constant 10 and above. Chase the hemoglobin for better oxygenation delivery. So plasma free hemoglobin less than 0.1 gram percentage. Then blood cultures as and when needed. Do not puncture the patient. Patient is hypernized. Patient is anticoagulated. It becomes very difficult for you to control that. So don't uh, attempt vena puncture. Use the central lines or from the circuit lines. Then for VA ECMO, you have to have a vascular uh, sonography or ultrasound of the limb to look at the vascular viability so that there is no ischemia of the limb. Then you need to target blood flows in combination with native cardiac function. As I've said, VV ECMO, heart is always better. It's good. The ejection fraction is usually in the good 50s and 60s. So don't have to worry about your heart and probably might not need much of inotropes. Sometimes you might need a small vasopressor because you have put them on sort of a VV ECMO. You tend to bring in something called SIRS where the patients get dilated, might need a NORAD on board, sometimes a bit of a vasopressin. 
So what are the ventilation strategies? Once you have put on VV ECMO, essentially the lung job is being done by the ECMO circuit. So your mechanical ventilation I mean, is of no use there. Yes, it need to be put on base settings. What are the base settings? A high peep of 10 to 15 centimeters of water so that your terminal alveoli are kept open. There is no collapse consolidation happening in these lungs. We want this airway to be patent and open. Whatever little oxygenation happens in the leftover alveoli, it should be allowed to happen. We can't switch it off, switch off the VOA ECMO. Low level pressure control, peak airway pressures of less than 20 centimeters of water, FIO2 of less than 0.6 with the adequate VV ECMO flows. So antibiotics as appropriate, H2 blockers to prevent stress ulcers, nutrition, try and give enteral nutrition all the time. Do not think of parenteral nutrition. As long as the gut is functioning, your patients are going to make a good outcome. How do you wean? Weaning is achieved progressively, reducing the sweep gas flow. When I say sweep gas flow, this is used to extract the carbon dioxide. So it starts at 10 liters per minute. So as and when the lungs are recovering, we slowly start coming down on your sweep gas. So come down to 8 liters, 6 liters. Oxygenation is happening. So oxygenation is not that important at this point of time. Ventilation is very important in uh, uh, lung injuries. If the carbon dioxide washout is not happening, you will struggle. Because post ECMO, carbon dioxide will pent up. Then you will have all the respiratory acidosis and all the problems associated with it. So increasing lung ventilation to ensure adequate carbon dioxide clearance. So here it gives you a sort of a leverage. You have got a sweep gas, you have got the patient's ventilatory mechanisms. So try to recruit the lungs for carbon dioxide washout as much as possible as you have started to wean your sweep gas flows. So when you're trying to uh, come down on the sweep gas, keep coming down, allow the lungs to be recruited and the ventilation is happening and do your ABG gases on a serial intervals and come to a stage where your sweep gas flow is zero and your PCO2s are maintained about whatever uh, uh, parameters you are wanting. At that point of time, give a trial of at least 24 to 48 hours. I'm not worried with oxygenation now. Your lungs are much better. They have resolved. Oxygenation is happening. What I'm worried is carbon dioxide washout. So let the carbon dioxide washout happen for the next 24 hours. Sweep glass, uh, gas flow is totally zero. It's cut off. So there is no help from the ECMO machine. There is no oxygenation happening. There is no uh, carbon dioxide extraction happening from the ECMO machine. Leave it for 24 hours. Patient is anticoagulated. So just the blood is coming out, but the lungs are still working. They have been recruited. So now it's a time to make a decision to decannulate. So once you have attained a 24-hour ECMO-free period, these lungs have recovered. These lungs have recovered. So then you can have to come off the ECMO. So you can decannulate. Here you don't need much to do. There's not much of mechanisms associated in a VV ECMO for decannulation. Switch off the sweep gas. Oxygenation is stopped on the ECMO circuit. You see, tend to see the just dark blood running out, going back into the patient, but still the oxygenation is maintained. So that implies the oxygen, the lungs are working. So cannulation, decannulation can happen the following day. You need to switch off the heparin infusion for at least four to six hours, and then they can be done either in the ICU or in the theaters. If it is a double lumen cannula, you can just take it out, apply pressure, you can give some protamine or need not just apply pressure, tight pressure or put a stitch across because if the cannula has been staying for a good number of days, there will be sort of a sinus tract. So you take a deep stitch and then shut off the IJV. Even in the femoral, if it is an open cannulation, tend to repair the femoral vein or if it is a percutaneous cannulation, take it out, apply pressure for a couple of hours and that's fine. And then your mechanical ventilation is back on board now. So your lungs are being resolved. So it takes another 48 hours before the patients come off uh, mechanical ventilation. There is a possibility of these patients having tracheostomy. So most of the patients' lungs tend to recover in usually by day 14, day 15. The first seven days, just don't bother about to take an x-ray because you won't be seeing any resolution in the lungs. So usually about day 10, day 12, you tend to see some resolution and then you can slowly start make progress in terms of coming on your oxygenation and your sweep gas. So once you are back on mechanical ventilator, you can just think. But as I've said, these patients, prolonged ET tube, I mean endotracheal tube is not advisable. So you tend to do a tracheostomy. So the tracheostomy itself can be pretty treacherous when the patient is on ECMO. So take help with the cardiac surgeon intensivists who are more well versed with percutaneous techniques because it's just a needle puncture and once you dilate and put the tracheostomy, usually there won't be any bleeding. And having a very trained uh, pulmonologist, inter interventional pulmonologist on board is of a great help 
and I'm very fortunate to have Dr. Jay Chandra with us. Uh, he had really helped me in building out a couple of my patients. So, so here we are going to discuss a small uh, example of a case which has been done in, in, in this hospital. This is a 30-year-old lady, pregnant woman. She went into Fernandez Hospital where she went with an upper respiratory tract infection and they thought that uh, any respiratory tract infection started some antibiotics, which she continued to, be, continued to be breathless. The following day went in, extra total white out, and then they realized that this is not going to help. They sent for H1N1, which turned as positive. That was the time when they shifted her back to, to us because our OpsMed team, which leads with the critical obstetric cases with us, Dr. Sunil Pandya and his team, they look after the critical obstetric cases. So they transferred the patient out here, 24 weeks pregnant, H1N1 positive. We thought probably we'll wait and we started her on Tamiflu and everything, but didn't do much help, had to be mechanically ventilated. And then I was called in, Dr. Jajendra was involved. Then we looked at her, her only option was ECMO. But here we have a pregnant woman. Uh, putting her an ECMO is going to be a dire straits for me. Then I said, look, I have to wait until the delivery happens or we have to wait for the lungs to resolve on their own. And then we just waited. In this interim, she went hypoxic, placental hypoxia, IUD. And then I said, with an IUD child and the previous cesarean section, the question of ECMO doesn't happen. Because the DIC picture, if it kicks in, patient will bleed and... Uh, Probably uh, we will lose the patient. I said, no, probably not right. Let's wait for the conservative uh, termination of the medical termination of the pregnancy. So we invoked the help of uh, obstetricians who had put in all those misoprost or whatever it is for the evacuation. So while this evacuation took about 72 hours for the IUD to be evacuated. And at this point of time, her lungs have never recovered. Her PO2s were holding on, uh, like about saturations of about 75, 80. But lungs were total white out, not much help. So this was on a typical Friday evening, 4 o'clock. I get a call from the anesthetist saying, Praveen, I think we have to consider ECMO for her now that she has evacuated. So we went up. She was continuing to have bleeding from the uterus as well, postpartum hemorrhage quite a picture. So we gave her tranics and everything. So then when I went upstairs, I was talking to the family. I mean, we have been talking to the family all throughout. So counseling is very important to the family members. We did tell them that there is something called ECMO is available for this lady, but we can't do it at this point of time. And then... I mean, before this actual incident happened, I was giving them a risk of about 80 to 20. So 20% of risk of mortality and 80% of coming through. But on that particular day, when the hyper she suddenly went hypoxic, bradycardia, arrested straight away. So we had to do CPR, anotropes, and after that, her, there was a res restoration of spontaneous circulation. And once the circulation has appeared, then I told the family, look, at this, it was almost a downtime of 10 minutes. Then I told the family, so I'm not sure whether this girl is going to make it or not because downtime of 10 minutes, no cardiac output for 10 minutes. So we need to look at her brain. Even if I do an ECMO, the chances of her coming out are only 50-50. Then they said, okay, fine, you've got to take a chance. So we went ahead and do, did an emergency VV ECMO. Uh, and then we continued with the things. So she had an ECMO for 28 days. She was in the ICU for 56 days. Uh, so I'll just play a brief bit. Really, video. So uh, fill out there. Post ECMO. You can see she has the trachea already. So that's the single bit tube cannula which we use to drain the blood out from the groin. Permission has been taken from the patient and the family to project this. So if you can see, the blood is coming out. That's the centrifugal pump. Blood is coming to the central pump, being wash, uh, driven into the oxygenator. It is connected to the oxygenator from the outside. You can see the difference there in the blood there. Now it's oxygenated blood coming back to the patient. So that's into the neck, into the interjugular vein. So this is where I say double lumen cannula will be of great help if you can avoid the groin. So that's her cardiac status. If you can see, rhythm is fine. Blood pressures are being maintained. That's the ECMO console with the 3.78 liters.
it has got a hematoma as well where you can control the temperature of the blood and also temperature of the body so it took 56 days of icu stay 28 days on ecmo 20 medical personnel 179 units of blood and blood products i'll tell you something dr jay chandra is here so he knows the amount of uh, efforts or turmoils we have gone through while we were while the patient was on ecmo most of the intensivists tend to do. We have this inline tracheal suctioning. This, uh, the catheter is pretty hard. When you try to do that, patient is heparinized. It's mucosa, very soft. It has injured the left side of the lung. And the left flank lung became totally white out. At times, I mean, at the time when the lungs were dissolving, we gave an hydrogenic injury there. So the lung was totally white out. There was a blood the clots in there. We, I took help with Dr. Gachandra. We tried to do a rigid bronchoscopy, flexi, tried to evacuate the clot. Every time I take out the clot, it fills back in. So there was no relief for us. So as, as and when she was progressing, the right lung has recovered, resolved. Then we said, okay, we have come to a point where this girl is alive now. Lungs are, one lung is working. So we'll bail her out. We'll, come, we'll decannulate her. We'll let her go home. We'll bring her back in a one month's time. If this lung recall resolves well and good, otherwise we'll plan for a pneumonectomy. So we made on that plan and then went ahead and then we made a plan to decannulate her on Holi. That was on March 13th. And fortunately, this girl, I mean, usually what we tend to do is we come off the sedation at least 24 hours before decannulation so that we need to see how the patient is in terms of her oxygenation and everything. So that particular night, she, the cannulas after being there for 28 days, there is a sinus tract. It's a sort of free flow cannula there. We got to be very careful. Every day in the morning, myself, my physicians, we look at the cannula, we try to put in new stitches in. Third particular night, we did this, and the cannula came out. And about 2.5 liters per minute of flow, so the entire ICU with blood, and I was at home. Luckily, my team was out here. Everybody pressed. I said, switch off the pump, give blood. So on that particular night, four hours, she received 30 units of blood and blood products. That 179 units, 30 units have contributed on that particular day. And again, back to square one, we said, is this lady going to be surviving? So we said, let's wait until 20, tomorrow morning, 24 hours later, awake, wide open, responding. And God has been great, that's all. <laughs> so that's the lady uh, with her child, only child. So uh, I'm mean, absolutely happy. If you can see the battle scars, tracheostomy, IJV, bit of a scar in her groin. So as I've said, ECMO is life-saving. It's a life-saving, it's a salvage device. If done at the right time, you can save lots of young lives. And thank you. Uh, what brings success, as I always say? Communication and teamwork. So the whole is the sum of its parts. I am not alone in this journey. It's my team members, my intensivists, my nursing staff, everybody. Dr. Jay Jandra in particular, a big thanks to him. And uh, uh, thank you again. Hope you have enjoyed this. And as I've said, we are just trying to give you the basics of ECMO. We are not trying to teach you the how do you manage this because it's quite a lengthy. The physiology itself is quite uh, varying. And uh, now that we have Dr. Suresh over here, the VA ECMO, it's a whole gamut of experience for somebody who has been in this uh, trade for a good number of years. Uh, and having worked with Dr. Uh, Balakrishnan at Fortis Malar, 15 years? 10 years. Bala? 15 years. So, stalwart of cardiac transplants in India, Dr. Balakrishnan and Dr. K.G. Suresh Garu. So, uh, we'll invite Dr. Bala next. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, one small. It's my privilege to give you a memento for enlightening us on ECMO. Probably my pleasure. After your brief tea break, I hope everybody is much more fresher now to absorb more uh, knowledge. And uh, the next week, uh, as you see, uh, the certificates for the registered delegates have been done, which can be collected. And those who have had a uh, on-site registration, the certificates will be sent out through courier. Please leave your addresses so that these certificates will be sent. They are very much needed for your accreditation top five years down the lane. So please take them. And leave your addresses with uh, Mr. AJ at the reception. We will forward your certificates to your home. 
I would like to request Dr. Jay Jandragar, who is the Chief uh, Interventional Pulmonologist uh, with Century Hospitals. And Dr. Jay Jandra is a name in himself. Uh, um, I'm worried uh, if Dr. Jay Jandra continues to do lots of interventional pulmonology, surgeons will be jobless. So he continues to do lots of interventional pulmonology with the airways. And uh, he has been a great support and help during my journey with this ECMO patient. And uh, uh, may I upon call, call upon Dr. Jay Chandra Garu to address you with bronchoscopy in ECMO. Thank you. You need to be specific. So at least you, as I've said, communication is very important. So you need to understand what is being given. So somebody gives a police catheter instead of a cannula, then it's in a trouble. So we don't want a police to go down the vascular axis. So got to be very clear in your communication, what you're asking for and what your uh, communicator is giving you. So most of these cannulas are uh, reinforced with wires, so the risk of kinking is not there. They're long cannulas. So it's a long venous drainage cannula, which probably most of the cardiac surgeons, when they do um, <coughs> what do you call redo surgeries, we tend to put in fem fem bypasses. We tend to use these cannula. So this is a long femoral venous cannula, which is used to access the femoral vein for drainage. The cannula has to sit at the mouth of the right atrium and IVC. So usually we tend to there is a stillet which comes with it. And then you have the, it's a usual Seldinger technique, so you need to measure it from the, basically the coastal margin right down to the, uh, time, uh, the point of uh, entry or exit. So that is the actual length of the cannula we should go in. Ideally, Raghu keeps telling me that it's about 25 to 30 centimeters. 35 to 40 centimeters to sit into the right atrium. And uh, this is, as I've said, it's the access cannula, drains the blood from the patient. So once the patient, uh, cannula is put in, post heparinization you need to connect it to the circuit. So before you connect to the circuit, both the cannulas, both the access and the return cannula have to be into the patient. And this is your return cannula, arterial cannula, which is put into the arterial side for VA or into the internal jugular vein for your VV ECMO. So the red is again to, mention, uh, to stress on that it's a return cannula. The oxygenated blood is coming through this small cannula. So this cannula can be used for your veno venous, where you put this cannula into the interjugular vein, or the veno arterial, where this is put into the femoral artery for adults, or for children, it goes into the carotid artery. Uh, Dr. Suresh was talking to you about a lock in the side port for distal limb perfusion. If you can see, there is a side port here. So this is the where we connect up another uh, outlet circuit which goes into the distal limb perfusion where we put in a 9 French aortic cannula, which is a pediatric aortic cannula into the distal femoral artery to avoid ischemia, distal limb ischemia. So you've got to be very careful. Huh? Once the cannulas are put in, huh? you connect them to the circuits, which is the circuit is out there. So this is for VV or VA. This is again your arterial cannula. Uh, Okay, uh, sorry, it's a venous cannula again. So it's again, it has got the full paraphernalia of putting a percutaneous insertion. Huh? So you have got your uh, wire guide wires, uh, your dilators and everything. So a serial dilatation is needed for the cannula to go into the patient. Okay, that's again a venous cannula, venous drainage cannula. This is the cannula which makes a surgeon's life and intensive life much more easier and comfortable. I think Dr. Suresh Rao admits that. Somebody coming, an obese individual, where you have to put a VV ECMO, 
it's, it's a nightmare to do ephemeral groin cannulation. And uh, especially in an emergency crash or even trying to do a cut down, it took about 20 minutes, I suppose, for this girl where I did a cut down for the femoral vein because there was no output, couldn't feel the pulse, couldn't feel any geometric uh, anatomical landmarks. You just go in blindly, open up, expose, then put your cannulas in. So this cannula will definitely is a savior for surgeons and intensivists. As I've said, this is a double lumen cannula. This is called Oregon. There are two companies which make them. One is Avalon, the other is Oregon. This is Oregon. Until last one year, I think it wasn't available. Yeah. Now it is available. Uh, it comes in pediatric, as I've said, for adults and even bit of obese individuals as well. So they can be used quite conveniently. And when you are spending so much of money on ECMO, I think spending on a cannula is not a great thing. It costs about 1.4, 1.5 lakhs, and it's readily available now. Big life very much easier and simpler to put in. As I've said, the blue is again the drainage cannula, the returns is the uh, red cannula. It looks like a Foley's catheter. That's the reason why I was telling Foley's catheter, putting into the vascular axis. So it's a white cannula, huh, where you have both your uh, drainage and uh, returns. So very friendly cannula, but you need a transesophageal echocardiography or in the cath lab. Sometimes you can do it by transthoracic echo as well if the operator gives you good views. Basically, we need to have a bicable view of the right atrium, so where you can see the ports, the actual the drainage ports sitting in the mouth of the IVC and mouth of the SVC for drainage. And uh, the return flow has to be directed towards the tricuspid valve. So you need to look at the flows as well once the patient is on ECMO. So this is a double lumen cannula. Okay, so now we move on to the actual machine. The circuit can't be opened. The circuit is a customized uh, circuit which uh, comes with your centrifugal pump and the oxygenator incorporated into it. You don't have to do anything. Cannulas are in. You connect the circuit. The circuit is assembled before the I mean, as the cannulas are going in. The circuit is assembled by the perfusionist and then it's primed as well. So Raghu, who my perfusionist, will talk to you about the components and the priming. As I've told you, ECMO is not, VA ECMO is nothing but a long-term bypass. But the only thing is there is no patient reservoir. There is no reservoir here for the oxygenator. Patient himself is the reservoir. And this is a long-term oxygenator which is made of silicon and lasts for 28 days as per the company. But uh, yeah, I'm sure uh, Dr. Suresh must have also run the VV ECMOs for more than 50 days. Our longest was 58, 55 days. So it, it's uh, doable. Uh, over to Raghu, please. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Raghu, working as a perfusionist for Century Hospital. First of all, I would like to convey my thanks to all of my team members, and mainly Praveen sir, Eman sir, Sunil sir, and anesthetist Harshil sir. Everyone who is supporting me in all, all the ways. Thank you. Coming to this, this is an ECMO machine. This mainly uh, consists of six components. This is the main one, which is called as a rotor flow console or ECMO console. This whole part. This is the ECMO console. And coming to this, this is the rotor flow. Rotor flow drive unit, where we place the centrifugal cone here. And this is the rotor flow emergency drive, where we can use as a hand crank uh, in regular CPBs. Regular CPBs, if there is no power or any breakdown of power or any problem with the UPS, we used to use the hand cranks. Here, this is used as a hand crank. And coming to this, this is the oxygenator holder. And this is the heater unit where we can maintain the temperature of the patient. And this is the blender where we can control the FiO2 and PO2 and PCO2 levels. Five plus, three plus. This is the basic introduction for the ECMO machine. Uh, this, here we have the one knob here. You can see the knob. By this, where we can control the pressure uh, flows, LPM, and both RPM. By this, we can manipulate the LPMs and RPMs. 
whatever we require for the patient. That is liters per minute, liters per minute LPM. Uh, and coming to the circuit, this is not the open circuit, so I cannot explain you the whole priming thing. Uh, nothing to do with this. All the circuit is the ready-made one. Just take the take it out, fix the oxygenator for it here, and the centrifugal cone here. We can open this and we can fix it here. The cone, centrifugal cone. Here for this drive unit, we will have the sensor here. This drive unit will have a sensor here. Uh, this sensor should be placed with a gel so that uh, uh, it will work for the long time. If the gel get disappeared or uh, this meant, it will show alarm. And again, we have to stop the mission and apply the gel, same procedure. Priming is nothing same as the regular CPB. We'll have the arterial line, venous line, and both are interlinked. Uh, the priming, we have to show it, but we cannot explain it here. Yeah. should be uh, air free. You can use RL for the prime. Double should be keep on using VG and VG need to have near ECMO. And what are the things yeah. that should be made available around the ECMO circuit? Obviously, first of all, I make it mandatory that every ECMO patient look up by two nurses. If there is a need for somebody to go to the washroom, the other has to be there. There is no question about it and there is no easy thing for that. Two nurses all the time. We do have issues, one nurse moved out, because the smallest uh, uh, doctor we can let the patient go. So the scanner comes out, or the... See, the problems associated with ECMO, whether, whether it is VV or VA, is risk of bleeding, risk of airlock, uh, risk of air embolization, risk of clot in the oxygenator, risk of clot in the pump itself. If there is a clot in the pump, pump if, I mean, VV ECMO, you can be pretty sure that nothing goes wrong because it's still the circulation is happening in the pulmonary circulation. Even if there is a bit of air, shouldn't be bothered. VA ECMO, if there is any air, any clot, you are asking for trouble. So we got to be very careful with regards to VA ECMO, especially in terms of air and clot. So the troubleshooting is like if the oxygenator gives up. See if the oxygenation is ha not happening. The, we tend to do lots of something called pre and uh, post membrane oxygenation. Gas is done. So we need to see whether this oxygenator is working or not. Say supposedly down the line, four days or four, ten days, the oxygenation is not happening. The PO2s are coming down. The saturation is not holding well. First and foremost, you doubt the oxygenator. Whether this oxygenator is working or not. Has, I mean, see the company has uh, marketed it for 28 days. but. Sometimes oxygenators can give up. They can be a leak. Because over a period of time, the membrane gets protein coated. The moment the protein coating happens, the oxygenation doesn't happen. The carbon dioxide extraction doesn't happen. So the membrane has to be pretty clean and clear. That is the reason why we are trying to heparinize it so that there is no coating on the oxygenator. If the oxygenator happens to be coated, then you need to look at your pre and post membrane oxygenation. So the pre and post membrane oxygenation will give us an indication how much of oxygenation is happening at this oxygenator? Is this working? Is it sufficient? Or should we be changing this oxygenator? Uh, so it has to be done. If the oxygenation is not happening, you have to think of changing the oxygenator. And it's not a big job changing the oxygenator. Usually you have to go back to the patient, I mean patient vitals have to be back on and then you have to switch off the pump and then clamp the lines. So as I've said, Always the tubing clamps have to be made available with the ECMO circuit and we don't, we request the anesthetist and everybody not to touch those tubing clamps to use for uh, releasing uh, their IVC port, the uh, Venflon ports and all the things. And I tend to see this camera, the tubing clamp being kept aside on the windowsill and we just, if there is an emergency, you start struggling, where is the tubing clamp, ask for tubing clamp because the clamps which come with this, that bl plastic blue ones, they don't hold the uh, tubing totally. So you got to have stainless steel clamps 
all the time, all the time. And I think a bottle of Vaseline need to be there all the time for the flow track because it has got a sensor to show one-way flow, the anti-grid flow. So the flow track will give you an alarm if the flow is not happening or if there is any obstruction. And also we tend to measure the pre and post pump pressures. So the difference should not be more than 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury between the pre and pump, po post. That itself signifies you between pre and post pump. Is there a resistance in the pump? Is there a clot in the centrifugal pump head? So you've got to be very careful with these things. Uh, and just before I forget, uh, October we have a All India ECMO conference in Hyderabad. Uh, it's a for four day conference with uh, stalwarts coming from uh, at the international and national faculty. And Dr. Suresh is there as a part of the faculty as well. Are you not? I haven't confirmed yet. All right. Okay. So it's uh, happening in, in Hyderabad in association with Kims and Star Hospitals. So I think it would be a good academic piece for everybody to understand about the ECMO and uh, assist devices, which are artificial hearts. Uh, and there is a hemotherm which will control the patient's body temperature, uh, which will have a uh, water connected up so that uh, you can uh, heat or cold the patient. Basically, you can reduce the temperature so that the metabolic activity comes down. Anything, Raghu? I think uh, that is it. It's a simple machine. If dealt properly, it's an angel. If you don't treat it properly, then it becomes a devil. So bleeding can happen from the cannulas. Bleeding can happen anywhere else. So got to be careful. I hope you guys have enjoyed to some extent and have understood ECMO, the basics of it. Uh, anything else you want from us? I hope everybody understood what an ECMO is now. Uh, thank you for turning around in large numbers and making this a grant successful. Thanks to Dr. Suresh and Dr. Jajendra Garu, and thanks for all my colleagues and team members. Uh, uh, it's, I think it's time for lunch. Uh, lunch is being organized next door, so please have your lunch. And then the certificates. Hemant, huh? uh, are we giving the certificates now? Yeah. Okay. So for, for the people who have registered themselves, the certificates will be given. And for those who haven't, please leave your uh, addresses. We'll get them posted to you. Thank you. Thanks for making this happen. Thank you again. And one last time, thanks to Satish from Make for bringing, escorting Dr. Suresh Garu from all the way from Chennai. I think Dr. Suresh got lost last time because of the language barrier. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you for watching this video. Like, comment and share and please subscribe this channel.